آزادی بیان یا لون زیو فری سپیچ Kim McDonald, thank you very much for speaking to Free Speech Debate. I want to start by asking you, why is freedom of expression important in a university context? Well, it's not just important, it's, it's obviously essential. I mean, it's impossible to conceive of a university without free speech. I mean, if you try to imagine an institution of higher education in the absence um, of free speech, it makes no sense, no sense at all. I mean, the whole point about a university is that it's an institution uh, which is there to facilitate, to encourage to permit uh, the freest and most robust exchange of ideas, intellectual exchange, rhetorical exchange, uh, open research, free research. I mean, all of these things require um, the ability to speak uh, and to communicate freely. It's impossible, really, to think of a university in any other context. How do you think counterterrorism measures have been used in the last decade or so to restrict freedom of expression? Well, one has to examine individual measures uh, individually. There's no doubt that we, we face a serious problem with, um, with terrorism, with political violence. Um, uh, and there's no doubt that we face some security threats. And of course, the government has to respond to them. I mean, my own view is that the best way to face security threats is rarely to close down communication. I think that's usually the wrong way to do it. And it's perfectly right to say that some counter-terrorism laws in recent years have tended to have as their aim closing down communication to an extent. One thinks of uh, offences of encouraging terrorism, of course. I mean, no one believes that terrorism should be encouraged. The problem is how you define an act of encouragement and what precisely the encouragement is directed towards. And these always open all sorts of questions that uh, Are, are really relevant to the exercise of our Article 10 rights, our rights to free expression. And so one has to examine these sorts of legislative provisions um, with care. In the university context, of course, we want people to be free to, be, to, 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 free to speak as openly as possible without the fear of some sort of criminal law uh, intervention on the part of the state. That is obviously an intervention that only should take place in the most extreme circumstances. I mean, obviously some speech is criminal speech. It's a crime to incite murder. It's a crime to incite racial or religious hatred. It's a crime to incite attacks, for example, on gay people. Um, and these sorts of speech, the, these categories of speech have traditionally been controlled um, uh, and that's appropriate. But we just have to be very careful about expanding Um, the areas of criminal speech uh, and when the government wants to do that we have to examine those proposals I think with very great care. Could you explain what the prevent duties are under the Counterterrorism and Security Act 2015? The Counterterrorism and Security Act 2015 uh, gives universities for the first time a duty to play a role in the government's counter-terrorism strategy for civil society. So universities have acquired a duty to take steps to prevent um, people on university premises from being radicalized, from being drawn into support uh, for terrorism. Uh, that's a fairly broadly based duty stated in those terms. Um, but it does include, for example, a responsibility upon universities to examine uh, with care Um, what visiting speakers, for example, are going to say on university premises. And this is quite, I think, um, problematic for all sorts of reasons. And the main reason is that the sorts of behaviours that we're being asked to surveil, to police now in universities, are not behaviours which are in themselves criminal. Mm -hmm. The prevent duty requires us to uh, prevent, insofar as possible, activities on university premises that are contrary to what are described as Uh, British values um, and in the guidance associated with the legislation British values are described as respect for democracy, the rule of law um, and uh, tolerance for other people's uh, religious beliefs. Now that, those, that's a very broad mm. definition of what it is that British values amount to and it's ca mm. capable of, of capturing all sorts of behaviour uh, and all sorts of uh, expression. For example, um, a Marxist might argue that the rule of law is a, a construct designed uh, to keep one class in power over another. Now that is uh, an argument which is undermining of the rule of law. Uh, are we seriously arguing that 
people on universities should not be permitted to express that view. Are we seriously arguing that someone should not be allowed to make the case that democracy uh, is a flawed system and we ought to have a theocratic system instead? It's not illegal to argue that. Mm -hmm. It's not illegal to argue that the rule of law is a class construct. It's not illegal for me to show disre disrespect for your mm -hmm. religion. Mm -hmm. um, and if these things are not illegal, if this isn't criminal speech, why should universities have any sort of duty to control it? Mm -hmm. And if they do start to control speech which is not criminal, what uh, impact is that likely to have on universities as havens mm. for intellectual exchange? Mm. I think the impact is bound to be a bad one. It's bound to be a chilling impact. And so I think we should devise a response to the uh, prevent uh, legislation, which while it allows us to be compliant, mm. preserves um, our ability to speak freely. You mentioned one of those British values as uh, tolerance uh, for other religions. There are some that say application of prevent duties uh, might unduly or disproportionately target discussions of Islam. Um, if, if that's the case, that prevent duties might be so applied, um, how do you think that application can be squared with British values? It, it could be discriminatory in its impact, that's true. I mean, I, I think actually that uh, if you look at British intellectual history, uh, it's pretty rumbustious, it's pretty rude in places, it's certainly very frank, uh, it contains a great deal that's disrespectful to one religion or another, it contains a great deal that's disrespectful to notions of the rule of law and indeed to notions of democracy. And I, I think that the definition of British values set out in the Prevent Guidance is uh, historically rather ignorant. We would be kissing goodbye to a great deal of uh, our British intellectual history if we if we uh, lived and died by the definition which is set out in the guidance attaching to the prevent legislation. I mean we must be allowed to be rude to each other. We must be allowed to be rude about each other. Um, I must be allowed to be rude about what you believe and you should be allowed to be rude about what I believe. I mean I shouldn't be entitled to incite hatred, racial or religious hatred, and I, mm -hmm. and I shouldn't be allowed to incite criminal offences, but mm -hmm. I should be able to speak um, frankly mm -hmm. um, and to express frankly what I think mm -hmm. about what you think. Mm -hmm. That's what a university is. Mm -hmm. And you were involved with amendments to the Counterterrorism and Security Act to ensure that freedom of expression and academic freedom are protected. Could you explain a little about those amendments? Some of us in the House of Lords felt that the prevent obligation upon duties to control uh, upon universities to control uh, speakers coming into our, our, our premises were inconsistent with a pre-existing legal obligation, mm -hmm. um, which is contained in the Education Act Number no. Two of 1986. Mm -hmm. That legislation was passed by Margaret Thatcher's government in circumstances where. Um, conservative cabinet ministers visiting universities were being howled down by students, quite wrongly. I mean, I don't think that the students were right to do that, but they were being shouted down, and Mrs. Thatcher became very angry about this. So uh, the government inserted a clause in the Education Act requiring universities to secure freedom of speech within their premises and for visiting speakers. It became a specific statutory legal obligation. And some of us in the House of Lords felt that the prevent duty was inconsistent with that. So we put down an amendment um, to the effect that universities in uh, carrying out their duties under PREVENT had to have special regard to their pre-existing legal obligation to secure freedom of speech within university premises and for uh, visiting speakers. So everything that universities do under PREVENT must be done within the context of their obligation to secure freedom of speech. And I think that's a very important concession um, and I think it makes our uh, ability to protect free speech uh, within the context of prevent much much simpler uh, and it makes the sort of policies that we propose to adopt in the face of prevent much easier to justify and to defend um, and so I think that is one good development that's come out of all of this. I wanted to ask you just about one aspect of the prevent duties. Some have said that the prevent duties might require counselling and welfare services to disclose to authorities comments that appear to show that students are being radicalised. Is that appropriate? 
Well, I think we have to be. I think we have to acknowledge that there is an issue here. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, let, let's let's imagine a situation in which someone in a college becomes aware that a student is regularly accessing, for example, um, internet sites which show um, beheadings, mm -hmm. and is. Uh, emailing links to those sites to other students. Mm -hmm. I think that is a situation in which uh, a college might be concerned, I would be concerned. Mm -hmm. I, and I think this gives a clue to the way that universities ought to respond to this whole question of radicalization. I think precisely it should be treated as a welfare issue. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the way colleges ought to respond. I mean, we all have in our colleges here in Oxford welfare structures and welfare mechanisms um, mm -hmm. and they are already primed to look out for welfare issues among students and I've no, um, I know there's no reason it seems to me why this shouldn't simply be considered uh, as another welfare issue. Mm -hmm. I mean most of the mechanisms that we have are, are capable of dealing with what it is the government says it's concerned about. So for example in, in my college, in Wadham College, mm -hmm. when students want to book a room for an event they, they have to get a chit from the Dean. Mm -hmm. They have to fill out a form saying what the event is and why they want the room and the Dean either signs it off mm -hmm. or says no. I don't think, can't think of any case when I've been here, the Dean has said no. But mm -hmm. I think these sorts of mechanisms are perfectly adequate mm -hmm. to deal with the problems which the government envisages. Obviously if the Dean got a, 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 a request from a student that seemed to indicate that someone was going to come and um, express criminal speech in a meeting then then that wouldn't be permitted. So I think I think that it is appropriate to regard um, this is a welfare issue. Um, some students may say that's intrusive and unacceptable. I don't agree. I think if someone is becoming involved in that sort of behaviour it is a matter that the college welfare um, authority should take an interest in and I'm quite happy to, to defend that if someone thinks that it's overly intrusive. I mean we, we, we look into welfare issues for our students all the time. It's just something that we feel we need to do as part of our pastoral role in the college. Don't you think it, it might be difficult to distinguish between students circulating emails about radicalization for the purposes of research and students circulating emails about radicalization for other purposes? Yeah, it could, and, and that's why if, if, if one gets to hear that it's happening, one wants to make an inquiry about why it's happening. I mean, if you have a group of students who are conducting research into, the, mm -hmm. into events in the Middle East, then obviously it could be entirely appropriate. I mean, mm -hmm. King's College London, mm -hmm. it's very well known, there's a centre called the, the uh, International Centre for the Study of Radicalisation, and uh, uh, academics in this centre are in contact, social media contact with jihadis, mm -hmm. um, including in Syria, and that's mm -hmm. entirely appropriate. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's serious, worthwhile academic research um, and they must be allowed to continue doing it. I'm sure there are academics in Oxford who take a great interest in this area. I hope there are. It's difficult to think of any other area um, uh, of research that's more important at the moment. Um, I mean, I'm sure there are many that are as important, but it's difficult to think of any that are more important than um, jihadism, the motivations of people, um, uh, and so on. And this is absolutely a legitimate area for academic research and we mustn't do anything that closes down that sort of research. It would be absolute madness <laughs> to convey a message that those sorts of areas are off limits for research. We should be encouraging research into those areas. So you don't think properly applied the prevent duties will have what you called a chilling impact on research or speaker events? I would rather that the universities had been exempted entirely from this legislation. Indeed, um, the First Amendment we put down in the House of Lords was to that effect. Um, and it got overwhelming support. Everyone who spoke in the debate supported excluding universities from the prevent duty. The only person who spoke against the motion, unfortunately, was the front bench spokesperson for the Labour Party. And she indicated that the Labour Party would not vote for this amendment, although all their backbenchers had supported it in debate. So I would prefer universities not to be part of PREVENT, but since we are, I think we have to be compliant with it. We have to find a way to be compliant with it, um, which allows us to get on with our research and to maintain free expression, Article 10 rights in universities. And I think we can do that by relying on our Education Act obligation to secure free speech. It's not ideal. It'd be better if we didn't have to go through these hoops. But I think we can come through them without free expression being unduly damaged. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think the prevent duty in universities is a mistake. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense at all mm -hmm. to have a statutory 
um, obligation in any way to control non-criminal speech in universities. In, mm. in my view, it makes no sense at all, mm. and we shouldn't be having to do this. Mm. But the legislation was passed, um, and we have to be compliant with it. Mm. I wanted to ask you, while we have you here, about one other important development in universities relating to free speech. That's the Roads Must Fall campaign. Roads Must Fall has said that a statue in Oxford should come down, and some have said the campaign is an exercise of free speech, while others have said it involves restrictions on free speech, it removes a statue that is a form of expression. What's your view of those arguments? I think it's an entirely leg legitimate debate, and I think it's good to have these issues raised, um, and I think there are arguments on both sides. Um, my own, if you're asking what my own view is, my own view is that the statue uh, should not be removed, it should be seen in its proper context and any any plaques or expressions which glori glorify Rhodes inappropriately or trivialize um, the things that he did um, should not um, remain but I don't think that the removal of the statue um, achieves what the protagonists for its removal suggest I, I don't think it's possible uh, to change history I think it's critical to see these things in their context, and I think if it's seen in its context, and if it's seen in its historical context, as a historical object, it should remain. Mm -hmm. Do I think the campaign is legitimate? No, I don't. Mm -hmm. What I will say, mm -hmm. though, is I think that, that, that we've been talking a lot about prevent mm -hmm. um, and about other threats to free speech in universities. I think there is a serious and growing danger in universities of self-censorship, mm -hmm. and I think some students are complicit in this, and I think it's a terrible mistake mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for um, people to think that universities are places where you can be protected from discomfort mm -hmm. or from offence mm -hmm. uh, or, or from things which are unsettling. Mm -hmm. um, a, a, and I think that many of the um, no platforming campaigns that we've seen mm -hmm. and the arguments for safe spaces are terribly misguided in the context uh, of universities. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think that the Roads Must Fall campaign is to be seen within that context, mm -hmm. but I think there is an, a movement amongst some students um, which, if it was successful, would have the effect of closing down discussion and closing down experience in a way which is completely inappropriate mm -hmm. for universities. Mm -hmm. It's often couched in language of safety and harm, mm -hmm. but in reality I think it's sometimes um, simply a desire not to experience discomfort mm -hmm. and, and sometimes even a, a fear of being challenged. Mm -hmm. And I think all of those things are quite inappropriate in the university mm -hmm. context. And I don't think this is to support one hegemony over another. Mm -hmm. It's simply to understand that universities can be difficult and unsettling places, and I think that people who populate them uh, need to understand that. And uh, as, as the courts in this country and, and in other uh, free trial countries, common law countries have often said, that there's absolutely no point um, having a, a law of free expression which protects your right only to say things which are inoffensive uh, and not alarming. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole point about free expression is that it, it, it protects the right to say things which are unsettling, mm -hmm. um, even things that are offensive, mm -hmm. uh, and even things that are unacceptable to some parts of the population. That's the whole point of free expression. Mm -hmm. There's no point having a freedom only to say things that everybody else agrees with. Kim McDonald, thank you very much for sitting down and speaking to Free Speech Debate.